Hello, I'm David Lauver and I'm going to talk to you for a few moments about my novel, The Blue Pencil, which was published in November 2012 by Sacristy Press. After I've introduced it, I'll do a short reading from the book. The novel is set in the years immediately preceding the Second World War. It's a political novel. It's about the uh, appeasement policies followed by the then Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and those who opposed those policies. The main character is a young, if you like, slightly left of centre idealistic journalist who's no interest at all in foreign affairs at the start of the uh, story, but who becomes increasingly involved and concerned with the way in which this country appears to be appeasing the dictators, Hitler and Mussolini. He also has to think about whether they're right or wrong. And he, the novel does weigh up evidence uh, as to you know those who supported Chamberlain and those who opposed him. How it works out, you'll have to find out for yourself by reading it. But it is written as a thriller. There are a number of strong fictional characters, but also there are some real people in it. For example, Claude Coburn, the editor of the famous anti-government news sheet, The Week, and also later, of course, a regular and very effective columnist with Private Eye in its early days. And also another very famous politician, Philip Noel Baker, Olympic athlete, uh, First World War pacifist hero, because he, he, he worked with the ambulance service in, in France, who even he ultimately found it impossible to believe that war with Germany could be avoided. The extract I'm going to read is set in the Christmas period around 1937. Now, Roger Martin, the hero, has already been warned by shady men from the security services, we're not sure whether it's MI5 or Scotland Yard, that uh, writing articles criticising the government's policies, particularly relating to appeasement, is something that he shouldn't be doing. He's had a verbal warning, and now on his way home from his office in Fleet Street, of course, um, and uh, just as he's about to uh, approach Waterloo Station where he gets his train home, he gets accosted for a second time by these strange characters. Now then, Mr Martin, you've been a naughty boy again. I peered through the gloom. I recognised the voice, so it came as no surprise to see Moustache Face staring at me below his hat. Next to him was somebody I hadn't seen before, a short, thick-set man, bareheaded and wearing a belted, fawn-coloured raincoat. I remained silent. Come on, sir, you've been upsetting Mr Chamberlain again, making all those nasty suggestions in your grubby little newspaper. He spoke quietly, his lips hardly moving, and stared straight into my eyes. My heart was racing, but I did manage to ask, What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Here's our Prime Minister trying to make friends with Adolf so we won't have to go to war again, and there's you and your mates telling people the Krauts are up to no good, and what's more, printing a whole pack of lies. How do you know they're lies? I gasped. He ignored my question and asked instead, Where do you get all that rubbish from? Somebody's been telling you something, or else you've nothing to print. I've no idea what you're talking about. I was about 30 yards away from the throng, making its way home in the smog. There was the usual rush-hour traffic, feeling its way through the blackness, and even though it was virtually at a standstill, the noise was deafening. There's no point in shouting out. Nobody would hear me, and even if they did, I doubt they'd come to my rescue. Nor was there any mileage in making a run for it. Mustache faced sidekick was blocking my escape route. He was getting annoyed with me. Come on, sir, do I have to spell it out for you? You've been writing stuff about confidential meetings. We would make things really unpleasant for you, he said, his voice dripping with menace and never once taking his eyes from me. So they weren't lies after all. Very clever, but it doesn't alter the fact that you've been having a go at the government and telling your pathetic bunch of readers about stuff that's none of their business. Now where did you get your information from? The same place that all the other papers 
that printed these stories got it from. Why don't you ask them? Oh, oh we will, sir. Don't you worry. But now I'm asking you. A journalist never reveals his source, and especially not to a couple of men who have crossed him in the London smog. I can see I'm wasting my time. I'm going to have to get my pal here to have a word with you. I've nothing to say to him either. You haven't quite caught my drift. My pal here doesn't say much. He's a man of few words. More a man of action, you might say. Now, where did you get all that shit about Lord Halifax from? Would they really attack me? I've no idea. But I was pretty frightened by now. I could give them Millie, but they'd soon find out she knew nothing. Under duress, she might just remember our little chats in the oaken saw. But it wouldn't be long before they realised she wasn't the source. Besides, they might arrange for her to have the sack, and I didn't want that in my conscience. On the other hand, there was no way I was going to give them Richard or Harry, so I decided to tough it out. I've nothing to say. Very well, sir, my pal here is going to have to teach you a lesson. Then perhaps you'll keep your nose out of things that don't concern you. This obvious threat spurred me into action. As the other man started towards me, I dropped my head and charged at him, hitting him just below the chest. He let out a cry of surprise and fell backwards against the wall. Get the bastard! Moustache Face shouted. But before either of them could react, I was off, sprinting down Stamford Street away from the station. I knew I could outrun Moustache Face, but wasn't sure about the other guy. There was still plenty of traffic about, most of it crawling in the fog or stationary. Then, as I dodged in and out of the cars, I had a bit of luck. I heard a shout, glanced round and saw the other guy sprawled on the pavement. I didn't wait to find out what happened to him, but carried on running towards Southwark Street. Near London Bridge Station, I looked round and saw a bus slowly approaching, so I leapt on the bus while it was still moving. The conductor gave me a funny lip, look and asked where I was going. Elephant Castle, I said hopefully, and he took a ticket from the rack. That was my second piece of luck. I had a vague idea where I was. By the time the bus reached the elephant, I got my breath back and recovered some of my composure. I stepped onto the pavement and caught the next bus, which was heading to Clapham Junction. I knew plenty about London's transport system, and I walked briskly into Clapham Junction Station and caught the next train home. I said nothing to my parents, but ate my tea and listened to the radio for a while and then went to bed. Sleep didn't come easily, and as I tossed and turned, I thought to myself I got away with it this time, but wondered for how long. They knew where I worked and probably where I lived. The next confrontation would not be long in coming. It's probably worth pointing out that Millie was uh, a kitchen maid inside Cliveden, where much of these conspiracies were hatched, involving the Prime Minister, Lady Astor, and Geoffrey Dawson, the editor of the Times. It's based on the fact that the newspapers, the radio, were both, and the cinema newsreels were all under severe pressure from the government in the appeasement years to toe the party line and i hope you'll enjoy it. it it's a true story if you like written fictionally interspersing real and fictional characters and it does read like a thriller and i hope you'll enjoy it <laughs>